Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you. Howdy, and welcome to another episode of the Atheist Experience, broadcast from the ACA studio in the Free Thought Library. I'm your host, Tracy Harris, and with me today is co-host Jen Peebles. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today, Jen? I'm pretty good. How about you? <laughs> good. Doing good. All right. Today is Sunday, October 11th, 2015, and we're live internet show based in Austin, Texas, dedicated to positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We're streaming live on Ustream and YouTube, and you can find this episode and archives of older episodes at the official Atheist Experience website at www.atheist-experience.com. Public show <laughs> feedback is welcome, and comments and criticisms can be posted at the open show thread for this episode located at freethoughtsblog.com forward slash AXP. There will be a link to the blog thread at our YouTube upload, and you can email us at tv at atheist-community.org atheist um, if you prefer that method. If you enjoy the show, please check out ACA's re related live podcast, The Nonprofits, the first and third Wednesdays of every month. You can find links at the Atheist Experience website. Feel free to join us for dinner after the show at about 6 p.m. at Threadgill's North location at 6416 North Lamar. Since we're no longer in the public access studios, you can call into the show via Skype. The show's Skype handle is The Atheist Experience, all one word. Submit a text message to that handle. If we can take your call on the air, we'll say your name, and after a slight delay, our screeners will call you. Once you're on, wait for the host to direct the conversation to your call. And before we talk about calls, um, you have a topic? I do. Okay. Yes. So first of all, it is National Coming Out Day. So for everyone who has come out, um, and we're talking specifically about the LGBT community. So for everyone who's come out, um, welcome out. Welcome to the life. Uh, for those who have not, I want to acknowledge people who, for whatever reason, feel like they can't come out. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, want to acknowledge that um, while it is a courageous act to come out, we understand there are many reasons for why someone wouldn't come out, and it's um, not necessarily a lack of courage. Right. Um, some people fear legitimately uh, that they will suffer violence or they will lose their livelihoods, um, friendships, all kinds of things. There's lots of reasons for not coming out. So that's why those of us who are out uh, feel an obligation to uh, make things better for those people who can't come out right now. So anyway, we celebrate uh, people who are out and those who feel they can't come out. Yeah, and it's always good to be out. We get letters even about atheism where people are like, why? What's the, what, why even bother? Right. Especially if they live in areas where it's very normalized right. to be an atheist. And we do get letters from people who are gay and atheists who say that there's a lot of similarities. And some of them, yes. I've seen several where they say, I came out as gay and my parents reacted so horribly that I just kept the atheist thing right, closeted because yeah. there was no step in there after that. I mean, you know, exactly. bad enough when I got the reaction for saying that I was gay. Or sometimes they'll say that the parents react really well to one and really badly toward the other. Right. Uh, which is, you know, clearly not something they predict before they tell them. Right. Um, and it's not just family. But, when, but it's important to be out for any community that has to be silenced, even if it, you're not in the part of the community that, it, that is being silenced or that is in an right. area where there's prejudice against you. Just being out exposes other people to the fact that you're there 
And even if your immediate friends um, maybe don't really need that lesson, a lot of people do. It yeah. makes people who are isolated feel better because they understand that there are other people out there like them. And it also helps because the more people that are on the, the fringe of kind of that straddle in mm -hmm. that fence, the more people they see that they're like, well, that's a good person and they, right. they're like that. And so maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. And so, right. you, you know, it's easy to look at um, people who are either very accepting or really, really bigoted and say, well, you're not going to change that person into somebody that's accepting. And sometimes right. you can. I mean, sometimes there's a group of people that just have to die off. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> yes. you have some people that really, maybe they've been raised in a bigoted way, but they don't lean that strongly toward it. And so when they're exposed to right. something that helps them just maybe stop and question, like we were talking about that right before the show, how you have all these preconceived ideas and sometimes all it takes is someone to come to you and just question it and then you start thinking, oh wait, you know, do I know what I think I know? Well, and, th and that's why um, the closet is very much something that supports the status quo, whatever that is. And, and in this case, you know, it, the status quo includes all of these negative stereotypes people have about a marginalized group, whether it's the LGBT community or atheists, for example. You know, being in the closet, not being open about who you are, supports that status quo, and, and it allows those stereotypes a, a little place to live. Yeah. And coming out, um, it humanizes the people who identify with those labels. Um, and it makes it much more difficult to discriminate against you. Um, my uh, my soon-to-be wife and I, um, <laughs> we have made a point of not hiding our relationship in our community. And part of that was that we have a young son that we're raising and family is very important to us. And we can't uh, convey the importance of family to him if we're ashamed of our family. So yeah. we've, we've never hidden the fact that we're a family and that, that you know, we're raising him together. And everyone in our community has been incredibly supportive of us. That they've treated us no different than they have any other um, family. And I think part of that is that um, we took a very uncompromising approach to that. And we've always said that if anyone ever discriminated against um, us as a family or our son because of, of his parents, that we would ruthlessly <laughs> remove them from our lives. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that that's, uh, I think, part of what being out means is that, you know, you, you end up uh, removing some stereotypes and making it easier yeah. for people to step forward. And you're doing a service to your community. Yeah. You're helping people overcome prejudices. So it is really important, not just for people who have difficulty coming out to be able to come out, but it's super important for people who, for whom it's easy to be out to make sure that people know that you're out. Right. And this kind of ties into um, something else I wanted to talk about, because I had a, a, a Facebook conversation a few days ago that ended up being um, rather contentious, because this person who does not live in Texas um, made some very... Um, I guess inflammatory comments about, well, we all just wish Texas would go ahead and secede, or, you know, and it follows along the line is that lots of people have made uh, about Texas, we should give it back to Mexico, which is not only very ignorant, but um, kind of betrays a, a lack of understanding of Texas history. Yeah. <laughs> U.S. didn't get Texas from Mexico. Um, but, I mean, all that aside, um, there are lots of ways of suppressing votes in in a, a region and convincing a marginalized group in this case atheists that it doesn't matter that nothing you do in Texas will make a difference um, that's as effective at, as a law that that says a certain class of people can't vote if you've convinced people that their vote doesn't matter that they shouldn't even bother then they won't yeah and so you don't need a law You've got them participating in their own victimization. That's hugely effective. And so what I, what I would like to, to uh, say is that think about what you're saying. Because here in Austin, it's not hard to be an atheist. It's not hard to be gay. Um, Austin's a very liberal, open-minded, progressive city. But, you know, and, and this person I was having a conversation with said, oh, I understand what you guys are doing in Austin, and I'd do anything I could to help people in Austin. 
people in Austin are doing okay. We're not the yeah. ones that need the most help, you right. know? But there are atheists sitting out there in Bastrop, in the Rio Grande Valley, yeah. and Lubbock, and Wichita Falls, and you know, there's probably an atheist sitting out there in one of those towns who's convinced that he or she is the only atheist in that county. And they're the ones that need the help. Yep. And they don't need people saying, you know, Texas is a lost cause, we should just write off Texas. Sure. They need to know that if they go to the, the polls and vote, if all of them get to the polls and vote, even if they're not voting for the same person, yeah. at least maybe we can remove some of the, the theocrats that are currently in charge of the Texas state government. Oh yeah, there's some wild ones. So, you know, even if we can't agree on you know, all the same candidates, we certainly agree that we don't want those guys in charge. Yeah, and I think there's been some discussion on this actually when they do like um, actual voting and poll reporting. Mm -hmm. So they'll say things um, like if a candidate is losing but they are, it's like neck and neck. Mm -hmm. People who are for the candidate who is behind, who thought maybe they weren't going to vote, may go out and right. be pushed to vote because they feel like, oh, if my vote matters because it's right. a close race yeah. and, and uh, my candidate's losing now. So mm -hmm. they might get up and go and vote. And then there's other people who, when they hear that it's a slaughter, they're like, well, I was going to go vote, but yeah, who what cares? difference does yeah. it make? So yeah, there is, um, there is that attitude of w if you think it's useless, you don't go and vote. And we have enough problem, I think, in the U.S. with people feeling like they don't want to vote. Right. You know, we definitely need people to get out and vote. A lot of times um, what these candidates are expressing is antithesis to what popular polling shows. Right. So you'll have popular yeah. polls that show support for all kinds of things that these candidates are against, or you'll see popular polling shows that people don't want certain things that these candidates are mm -hmm. promoting. Right. So it's really, I mean, you have if you if you act like you don't own it and you give it away, that's the surest way to to, to lose control of it. If you want to own it, you know, then you better act like you own it. Get out yeah. there and vote and do what you can do. But sitting around and not voting and not being involved, I mean. There's so many times I hear people complain about different aspects of civil service or mm -hmm. the government, and I, I'm always stunned at the, the lack of connection in their heads with, with how they're connected to owning this. Yes. It's like, this is yours. Yeah. The reason it's not behaving like you want it to behave is because you're not <laughs> owning it. Yeah, I mean, you're not you participating in this. It. Yeah. It's gonna, if you don't own it, someone else will. Yeah. There's definitely somebody who's going to go take charge of it if you're not willing to take charge of it. So it's yeah. just up to you if you want to if you want to go you know to bat for this thing or not. But um, definitely, if you don't if you don't act like you own it, someone else will. Yeah. And along that same line, last comment I want to make here: Stop telling people that if you live in Texas that you can't hold public office as an atheist. That is not true. It has not been true since 1961. Yeah, a lot of times it takes uh, a little bit of effort to pull a law off the books, and so when something is invalidated yeah. by a SCOTUS ruling, they don't necessarily go through the effort to then have it removed from yeah. the actual code, but it's no longer valid. So yeah, that's a right. that comes up and, more than just and in, atheists in office. But yeah. In this case, it would require a constitutional convention to remove that from the Texas Constitution. So. No one in Texas is up for paying for a constitutional convention. Yeah, just to remove a law that's no longer to re in Yeah, to remove a law that doesn't have any impact anyway. And I want to so. make, because the studio is going to have to get the caller on the line, so I do need to cue somebody up here. Let me look at this, and let's say we go for, there's a couple calls that kind of roll into each other. So I'm going to say if we could go with um, line four with Ethan. So go ahead and, and see if you can queue up Ethan and then we'll start rolling the calls from there because there's a little bit of a progression that appears to, uh, to be logical there. Oh. All right. So, up. Oh, did they take our mics off? I don't know. I can hear you. Oh, okay. It sounds a little different. Yeah, now, it does. Now it's loud again. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can still hear you, though. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, I guess we're uh, having, um, work, still working out some technical issues in the studio. So people email us from time to time making suggestions. Um, I, I guess unless you know what we're doing here in the studio and what kind of equipment we already have, those suggestions tend to be less than helpful. So yeah. just, just to let you know. I, not that we don't understand why you yeah. send them, but just FYI. Yeah. Um, and it looks like it's blue. So Ethan, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we I hear you great. We can. Perfect. So go ahead. What do you got today? 
Uh, let me just mute the stream. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All the callers take a hint. Um, yeah, please do mute the stream when you get on the line. So uh, I wanted to ask, um, I'm an objectivist, and I get, I have my own basis for my morality, but I feel, you know, to tie it into the theme for today of where do you guys get your morality and how do you justify that? Oh, was that our theme today? I was today? gonna say, I don't know if that was our theme, but well, you're welcome I, I to mean, talk about it. Sorry, to tie it in, of, I'm sure people will be getting the question if they come out to their relatives. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of why, how can you be moral without God or, or things sure. like that, so. Okay, so. <laughs> so. Are you asking? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't. I mean, I've got thoughts on it. I, yeah, go I can ahead. Try to trim it. Um, I, yeah. I, I want to just you know forewarn everyone that I'm usually the black sheep when it comes to my moral thinking. So not everybody agrees with me, and I understand that I'm in a minority on this. But in general, I think that coming out of uh, as a member of a social species, we are endowed with the capacity to recognize one another above and beyond other species, right? So wolves recognize other wolves in a way that allows them to cooperate with other wolves like they can't cooperate with anything else. And human beings are very similar, right? We're a social species and we cooperate as groups and teams and that's pretty much the way that we've evolved to survive and that's why we're a member of a social species, or why we're labeled that way. That social aspect comes with all kinds of things, right, that other social species also exhibit. Like we have a capacity for guilt. We have a capacity for empathy. And this is in general, right? Of course, some people, just like any attribute, we have, I can say we're bipedal, but that doesn't mean every human being born has two legs, right? I mean, there's always going to be anomalies. But in general, we have these weird little feelings and uh, responses that help us interact with each other in a way that we tend to not really lend outside the species quite as broadly. And other social species have the same inclinations. And for me, the idea of morality comes from that recognition as you being like me. So like me and you are alike. We are both human and we are both part of this group that is more cohesive than things outside the group. So I have to recognize your agency and I have to respect and regard that when I recognize that like me, I have agency and I like that agency respected and regarded. So I, w I need to understand you're the same, that I understand that you think like me and you behave like me. Not that we are, uh, not that people don't have diversity, but that in general, basic things like, I don't like to have somebody come up to me and beat me up, means that I'm probably not gonna go around beating you up because I'm gonna assume that this probably would be unpleasant for you as well and that if I try to do it, you're probably gonna defend yourself in the way that I might defend myself and it's gonna be a bad scene. So that's where I tend to think the foundation for what, you know, it's funny because religious people, when they talk about morality and they talk about how uh, you know that these human beings are special and it's like I agree we do know that they're special because we're a member of that group and we recognize we're members of that group and that's what makes it special that's what makes it useful and helpful and beneficial and something that you want to keep having be useful and beneficial to yourself and to the group um, so that would be where where I kind of start and then I would build from there but that's where my if somebody said where do I get my morality that's kind of the foundation of where I begin building yeah yeah, and I think, uh, you know, my foundation is probably, you know, I have certain values and because I value these things and I, I can observe that other people also value these things, um, I'm not going to do something to them that I wouldn't want them to do to me. So it's a very much a reciprocal kind of thing. Okay. I mean, is that, it's, it's probably not surprising, right? I mean, I wouldn't think that that's a surprising response. But no, maybe. not at all. <laughs> um, I, I think that that runs into a problem when you have somebody that lacks empathy or is in, unable to empathize with other people, that they might not understand, uh, you know, that I even though I like it, somebody else might not like it. Yeah, there's always um, going to be anomalies, and that's why you have to have laws, right? Then you start, and, and like I say, even wolves will discipline yeah. other wolves in a pack when somebody's not behaving like they should be. 
And the, the one example that I saw that was like most amazing to me was when there, and I've used this on the show before, there was a, a, like a, a male and female pair of wolves that were mating and then you had the rest of the pack. Mm -hmm. And one of the male wolves kept trying to mate with the, with the alpha female and he's not supposed to because he's not the alpha. So the, the, mm -hmm. it wasn't just the alpha male that attacked him, it was the whole pack that attacked him, basically saying, you don't right. do this. And so he kept trying, like every time they would go do something, he would run back and try to get with the female. And this went on for a while until the entire pack literally exiled him. They ran him off their territory completely and he was on his own, which is very dangerous situation for a social animal. He was left outside and then how they knew this, I don't have a clue, but I guess it's probably like that for people. You know, if you're observing people, you're probably like, how did they know this? Um, that wolf came back and the pack allowed him to come back and he issued like what was like a, an acceptable challenge for the status of mating with that female and then him mm -hmm. and the alpha male battled it out while the rest of the group just sat back and watched and he won and then he was the new leader and i was like wow that was a really interesting uh, you know thing to watch and for me it's kind of similar with people i mean if a person starts doing things that are detrimental to the group i think the group right. will step up and say okay we need to not do this <laughs> right like you need to not do right. it and i think it would if the person kept doing it of course the response is going to escalate as the the more detrimental it is to the group the more the response will escalate until you end up with a situation where you either are exiling someone, killing them, locking them up for life, or whatever it takes to ensure that they don't continue damaging the group. Okay. Um, thanks for the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that, especially with religious people who tend to think that only human beings operate this way, that other species don't have this kind of structure. And, you know, uh, yeah, obviously we have like a huge infrastructure compared to other species, but um, what they do have is very interesting and I think it's very telling about what it says to us as a species when, when we have these magical inclinations that religious people like to say God gave us, right? These God-given things. It's like it's not God-given, it's, it's other animals have it too and you just have to observe them with, a, with an ounce of respect. Right. Yeah, all social um, animals have some sort of social rule that they follow, or, or set of rules that yeah. they follow for interacting with each other. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of like part of the definition of a social species is that you have yeah. a social structure that the you're, less you're involved in. The less social you are, the less you're going to see that. So there's some yeah. animals that are not as social that maybe come together for territorial disputes and mating. So you'll have an animal that t generally tends to run around on its own, but then every now and then mm -hmm. it comes together with another one of its species just to mate, or it comes together with another one of its species to fight over a boundary. Um, and in those situations, what you're looking at is when they do fight and when they do uh, mate, there are still protocols, right? You fight over that boundary and the loser gives up. They go right. away. You know, it's, and, and when, you're, when they're doing the mating, there's always these protocols about mating, whether you know, the, the female may or may not have certain amount of power in that, in that uh, response. And right. it's, just, it's kind of interesting. You know, sometimes they'll do mating with like, multiple partners. Sometimes they'll go off individually. I mean, it's, just, it's wild. I, I think that it's very interesting to observe the similarities, especially in conversations about morality when you're talking to religious people. Sure. Humans like to think they're special, and they came up with everything we by themselves. We are number one. And, yeah. um, we are special. That, that also reminds me of um, the story of, I think it's like monkeys within a room, and there's a piece of fruit on top of a hill. And if one of them goes up to try and, and take the fruit, you the tester sprays them all with water. Yeah, be mm. careful, because that's more myth than fact. Mm -hmm. There, if you look it up online, there is a study that it, that that story begins to be based on. But the one I heard was so exaggerated from what when I went and looked it up and found out what the actual study was, it was so different than the story that I was told. So I know the thing you're relating to, how they like beat them up when they go after the thing that they're not mm -hmm. supposed to eat. Um, it wasn't quite as dramatic as the the tale that I came across online that I was exposed to. And for a while, I actually just kind of accepted it and was like, oh, that's interesting, and just adopted it. And then when, one day I looked it up and I was like, oh my gosh, that didn't really happen like that. So be careful uh, with that one. 
I'll fact check myself. <laughs> yeah, do, I had to. I mean, so I, I understand, and I'm, I'm only pointing out because I did look it up, and it was one of those things where I was like, ooh, no, it didn't really happen like that. But relating to that story, it's important for us as as intelligent, you know, sentient people yeah. it, it is to, you know, check on our justifications for the things that we do and sure. not to rely on them as traditional or or just to accept them as cultural standards, is right. to sometimes challenge them and, right. and make sure they're there for the right reasons. And even if it's something yes. that maybe has served, right? Just because you've always done it that way and there was a good reason why something may have been done that way doesn't mean that things don't change and that you don't right. have to revise or adjust those rules to make them better. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. That's right. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's good either. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So you can't judge things by age. All right. Thanks, guys. Sure. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Guys having I, me on. Thank you. And so this kind of rolls, I think, into Brett. So if we can queue up Brett next. Yeah. There's a part of me that's like, uh, here we go. But, you know, here we go. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> this is always a fun topic. Yes. And I talked a lot. You might want to take the next one a little bit. Okay. Since especially because I'm like, this looks painful potentially to me. <laughs> Possibly, You're, yes. You do much better, I think, with this topic. Hello. We'll see. Hey, is Hi, that Brett? Brett? That's, that's me. Okay. Howdy, hey, Brett. Hey, is this Tracy and Jen, right? It is it Tracy is. and Jen. Uh, yeah. There's a lot. Okay, well, wait um, a second here. We're ha I'm just going to warn you that we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. You've got <laughs> nailing that. And we yeah. have a weird oh, whistle. <laughs> yeah, there we hey, go. Hey, you sound better, though. Oh, awesome. Okay. That okay. helped. The magic Are we ready? scree helped. Yes. <laughs> Go for it. All right. Uh, I was wondering how we can support the right to have an abortion uh, from the standpoint of secular morality. Like, if we can agree that, that life is preferable to death and that we should reduce harm when possible. Yes. Like, how, how can we come to the conclusion that we should allow abortion? Yeah. Okay. I, I said I would give this to you, but can I ask Brett just one quick question? Sure. Uh, what? Hey, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to ask you a quick question. Um, life is preferable to death, right, is what you uh -huh. just said. And the other one was we should reduce harm as much as possible. Or when possible, when it's, when it's when, time. Yeah, it's okay, time. when possible. Now, would you institute a, pol a public policy to force people to become blood and organ donors? Based on those two foundations? Probably not. Why not? Um, I mean, that organ, would that would reduce like organ harm. Donation from cadaver, like cadavers, I could understand. Like no, after death. Organ no, we're donation. talking about living donors. Like, yeah. If you're if you're a match to somebody, you have to give them your kidney. Well, even blood donation. Yeah, would you, or even would blood, you compel yes. blood donations? Um, no. Why not? We can't harm in our means to do so. What? No? And I guess that should be optional. Why would that be optional? I'm not particularly sure. Is that a, are you struggling with why you think that? Yeah. Okay, help him out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Um... So you're saying that someone can't use your body to sustain themselves without your permission? Uh -huh. Okay. So what's different about a oh, pregnant we're, woman? We're applying that to... Yes. Yeah, I sort of understand now. Yeah, okay. and especially when you think really of, sure. of the comparison of a nine-month dangerous gestation that can result in all kinds of problems with the much less dangerous and much less, more, much more temporal situation of donating a pint of blood. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's risks involved. I mean, I have a friend that ended up in the emergency room after donating blood. Now, I'm a regular donor, so I can mm -hmm. donate. But the reality is, there's a risk to you involved, and you are not required to risk your, your, your health and your life to help somebody else survive. Okay, yeah. Um. I understand it a bit better now. Okay. I had originally thought that, you know, if if we leave it alone, it's eventually going to become a person. Sure, sure. And if that were me, then 
I I mean, I would take life any day, but the, the way you put it was a lot better. Well, that's why it's okay. a choice, because there's a risk, right? So yeah. you uh -huh. have to, it's like with the blood donation, when you said I would, I would keep it optional. Well, that's pro-choice. I would keep it optional. I, I would let the person who has to take the risks that has to decide whether they want to endure nine months of of pregnancy, which is not a picnic, and often right. sends people to an emergency room, can can cause issues, physical issues for you for life, right? And can and some people die, um, and so if a person's going to go there, they have to make that decision. And, and a lot of times, people tie that to the sex, right? And they'll say like, "Well, you had sex," and you know, and it's uh -huh. like, look, no, the reality is. When you had sex, you had no way to know that in a in a month or two you were going to get hit with the information that you were now pregnant. And when you're hit with that information, you have a whole other set of options in front of you and decisions that you have to make and a whole other set of risks that have now popped up that are the right. result of this decision, um, which make it completely separate from the sex act. Yeah. Well, it's like we always say, um, consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy. And consent to becoming pregnant is not consent to remaining pregnant. Correct. A woman's decision ah. to carry um, a fetus to term has to be an ongoing act of consent. Right. Because she's giving up the use of her body sure. for the duration of that pregnancy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just thinking about it now. So. Yeah, and okay. I mean, definitely uh, is okay to think about it. You know, I mean, uh, I'm not a theist, but it's been a hard thing for me to, to sort of contemplate and grapple with, I guess. It, it, is, sure. it is something that I think a lot of people struggle with, especially because religion has so powerfully owned this dialogue for so long. Right. And so we're only now, really, like only recently seeing um, a dialogue coming out where people are, are open about it. So in the past, mm -hmm. you had the people that did it keeping it quiet. So it was like, I would go and do it, and I felt like I needed to do that. And then they would hide because they didn't want to be vilified by society. And then you, the only people you had creating the narrative were the people who were against it, mm -hmm. right? Now, prior to this, you had women dying, and they were willing to come forward and right. tell their stories of how they almost died, or the people that died that they knew that were that had done this. And this is why this question was so huge, because women were dying over this, like it was really bad. And we've kind of forgotten that time, I think. And now what's happening is we're seeing a resurgence with people coming forward and saying, I had an abortion and I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Right. And I'm going right, to talk right. about my, my story. And this is super important because it means that now we can have another side to the narrative and that's what we've needed. Well, and the other thing is that because of this religious contamination of the dialogue involving abortion, you've now got uh, these religious organizations, these anti-choice organizations who are coming in and saying, oh, but they're aborting you know, nine-month fetuses and and harvesting their brains, and you've got you know fake videos out there oh my gosh, yeah. that are are okay. basically poisoning the dialogue about this. Um, and, and what I want to tell you is, you know, that video has been exposed as a fake. Um, that um, that fetus that was shown in that video was actually a stillbirth, um, and there was no it, the the audio about harvesting its brain was something that was dubbed on yeah. after the fact. Um, had nothing to do with a Planned Parenthood clinic. Um, and Chavez and came out, I posted on my Facebook wall the article yeah. quoting Chavez saying, I found no wrongdoing. So yes. he did all that crap just to get a few sound bites for the news so that he could be accusing Planned yeah. Parenthood. Oh, yeah, it was definitely in front of a camera. Oh, it was I looked horrible. into it in a few. Yeah. You look up the guy who. Uh, oh, the guy who made the video con he's, confessed the He's as like well. a known. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is it, like pro life, you know? Yeah. Right, and so really, and, really far right. And you know, the other thing they do is they take video that was taken from China, where they have this, you know, for years they've had this one-child policy, and they would force women to have an abortion, yeah. even if they were, you know, pregnant and and the fetus was viable, they would still force women to undergo an abortion, which at that level involves actually yeah. induced labor and delivery. Okay, it's not um, this, you know, yeah. vacuum. And for the record, pro-choice would not support that. Exactly, and <laughs> so, and yeah, I would I would argue that that is the most. That's not um, a choice. That is that is about as opposite of the pro-choice position as you can get. Yeah. Because 
Um, it, I'm, I'm very much pro-choice, and it's not my decision, you know, whether a woman gets pregnant and stays pregnant or not. It's her call either way. Mm -hmm. Even if she's carrying a child that has some kind of catastrophic chromosomal anomaly, I support her right to carry that child for as long as she needs to and in, and to terminate that pregnancy whenever she needs to. So, um, you know, it, do you support Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, do you support terminating a pregnancy that you know they might be uh, mentally disabled or something of that sort? I do think you? I think that um, it's the mother's choice. Yeah, it is. She's and, the one that has to deal and, with the repercussions of this thing. And you know, the the I guess the the most common chromosomal anomaly that comes up is Down syndrome. Can I just qualify something? Yeah. When I said this thing, I was not referring to the fetus. I was referring to the situation. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make that very clear that yeah. I would never have referred to a human yeah. being so, or even a potential human being in those terms. So Down syndrome is probably the most common chromosomal anomaly that comes up. Okay, and we know that it that it includes, among other things, um, an intellectual deficit in the child, uh -huh. and and that varies. Okay, um, most women who find out they're carrying a Down syndrome fetus choose to terminate the pregnancy. Okay, I think it's something on the order of like ninety percent. Um, of the the remaining um, Down syndrome children, uh, where the mother chooses to continue the pregnancy, I fully support that. Because um, kids who are born with Down syndrome, if you look at them, most of the time they're happy, you know? Yeah. And so if the parents choose to take that on, they want to do that, that you know, they're not causing, you know, undue suffering or anything. These kids are happy. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So. All right. So. Well. Were you about to say something? Sorry. I no, wasn't. No, go ahead. Uh, I think we're good. No, uh, yeah. A Planned Parenthood near my town got got burned down, like, oh, wow. in the arts and Okay, actually. there was one in Washington and one, where was the other one? Where are you? Um, He's in Los Angeles. Was Los around, Angeles, okay. Around Peepee Valley, I Yeah, think. yeah. There was yeah. a couple that got arsoned. Like, That's horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah. the picketing. I think if you're standing outside a, a clinic yelling at uh. someone on what might be the worst day of their life. Yeah. It's a pretty yeah. horrible thing, so... Yeah. yeah, we actually have, uh, right down the road from me, protesters that are kind of routinely out there probably a couple times a year that go out and hold their signs up. Now, luckily, the entrance to the clinic, you have to drive through a gate to get to it, and then it's like private property once you're on that. So they have to stay out by the road. But they don't strike me as the harassing sort, so I don't want to necessarily, you know, they just kind of quietly stand there with their signs. But, uh, well, you do yeah. have people, though. Yeah. It can get, it can it can yeah. get ugly. Yeah, yeah they're sadly the, the, the people who are so pro-life, they're going to kill you to demonstrate just how pro-life they are. So. Yeah, or burn down your property. Or yeah. It's like, whatever. Um. All right, well, thank you for <laughs> right, taking right. my call. Thank you, Brad. Thanks. Yeah, think more about it. Okay, and the next one up, we've got another one that rolls right into this, and it looks like that's Till in Germany. And I, I'm, I'm neglecting to, to give the locations, I guess. I'm yeah. just giving names it's okay. here. Not being a good host. <laughs> no, you're good. We're fine. So yeah, we can get so, if we can get Till queued up. We've got another another more. We got a more. Like it's just like a morality show today. I know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Matt should have been here. That's his well, thing. Well, Brett's call was interesting because there are um, lots of people who have not actually yeah. considered. You know, and and it's like I fully concede that the fetus is human. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not uh, dog life. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not the that's issue. Tainted. It's it's an issue of you know, bodily integrity. Yeah. And, and it, it is interesting though. I do like to kind of get people to think to say, and also you get to test where they're at, where it's like, you know, so would you do this and would you do that? And mm -hmm. if the person is like, you know, I mean, Brett could have come back and said, well, if it's up to me, I would make everybody donate blood. You yeah. Know, there's people that would yeah. do that. So it, you have to kind of gauge, I guess, where somebody falls on that spectrum. But also if somebody says, no, I wouldn't, it's then the question is, okay, well then why not? Because what mm -hmm. you just said should lead to that. So why wouldn't you? Right. And, and sometimes, sometimes you don't have an answer. And I think that's a good thing too. Some people are afraid to engage. I know I was afraid to come on and do the show when I was first invited because I just thought I'm gonna be asked stuff and what if I freeze up? What if I don't have an answer? And it's right. like, you know what? It's okay to say, well, that's interesting. I need to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have Till. It looks like you're on. Till, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Hey. I'm there. Howdy. All right. Hi. 
So, um, yeah, it seems to be all about models today. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my question would be about um, how to actually conclude the step from uh, atheist to humanist. So, um, because I, um, I grew up as a, a cultural Catholic and always uh, kind of hated uh, going to church and so on. And so my attitude was always against religion. And now I'm I'm trying to get something I'm actually in favor of, and so, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> what would be, uh, what would be your um, your advice or uh, resources or your story, um, whatever? It's quite a quite a broad question, I know. Oh, well, there's lots of a, of humanist associations. I mean, so there's yeah. tons of resource out there because a lot, there's a, and many many atheists identify also as humanist. I mean, that is a right. we we've got humanist groups all over the place in the U.S. I don't know what you might have in Germany. Do you know? Uh, have they, you looked for resources there? Are. There are okay. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so, um, how do you um, to to get uh, to get specific? How do you actually decide on on moral questions? Oh well, uh, and or or values. Well, I mean, part of that starts with your own values, and I mean, you certainly know what you value in life, right? Um, do you? Yeah, more do or you? less, but um, trying to question it and trying to. Um, yeah, to, to find it for, and define it for my own is yeah. uh, is a different thing than just um, taking what you yeah. what you grew up with or what you um, kind of intuitively value. Were you able okay. to hear the response to the first caller who asked about what is the foundation for your morality? Yeah, definitely. Okay, did that help at all? Um, uh, more or less, but um, uh, about the uh, the specific value. So, for example, uh, let's take what uh, here in Germany um, about the um, refugee crisis, as they call it. Right. Like, right. how how to specifically um, decide on? Okay, sh um, how should I um, act in this case? How um, okay. am I supposed to help right. them? Am I supposed to yeah. be against or whatever? Yeah. You got a lot of stakeholders in that, right? So there's a lot of different mm -hmm. people who are going to have liability and benefit from this situation, right? That all have some interest in how this is handled, correct? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, and that's what makes it complicated because you've got people all over the place that are like coming into this hub, which is the refugee crisis. So what works for somebody else could cause a problem for someone over here. And you know, you, these, are, mm -hmm. these are stakeholders in this question. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so you're right that it's complicated. There's not just a one-size-fits-all solution, but I would say that in general what, would, what you'd have to look at from a nation taking in refugees from another nation would be resource and capacity, right? So you, you might say, I would love it if we could take all the refugees in, but we don't have that capacity or that resource, right? Because this is a lot of resource and a lot of capacity mm -hmm. that's required to handle this. So you need help, right? It's like we can't, Germany can't do this all. We can help, but we can't take all of it on. And so you have to just sort of examine what you have available. And unfortunately, in a situation like what's happening with Syria, you have to do this very quickly, right? right. So you've got to make yeah, these decisions fast because you've just got a ton of human beings that are sitting there. And what do you do with them, right? And um, I think that in general, the response should be to help, but you also have real world pragmatic restrictions on how much you can help. So you have to kind of look at what you can actually offer versus what's required. And then you come to the table and say, okay, we looked at our, at our situation and here's what we can commit to. Um, as a, and, and it's, like I say, it, that's an easy kind of overview of something that's not an easy situation. But in general, it's gonna be, what can you do? Yes, I do think that people are obligated to help other people in general. And so I would look at it from a standpoint of what can we offer reasonably without putting the, putting ourselves at some kind of you know risk of resource issues, um, and what is needed, and what can we contribute, and what are other countries gonna gonna commit to as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean it, it, that that simplifies it to a grotesque level, I know, yeah. but I don't know how else you would approach it other than saying this is where this is where we start. Yeah, I mean. It, I don't know if you recall, um, not that long ago, the U.S. faced its own sort of border crisis with the 
influx of basically, or we had an invasion of Guatemalan toddlers um, who were, were fleeing some really um, horrendous conditions down in Central America. And, and they were coming over the border in droves. And um, in, in that crisis, what I saw were certain public officials stepping up and acting, uh, you know, like real humanitarians, um, people I was, I was proud to have in my state, you know, who were doing everything they could to help, and then some. And then you had others um, who were um, really bent on doing as little as possible for people in a desperate situation. So I think that a crisis situation like that often sort of reveals people's character in a way that, you know, day-to-day -day things just don't. Um, and, and, you know, you can, you can take a look at, at how public officials handle these things and sort of, you know, if you were in the situation of the person needing help, who would you want to, you know, be faced with? Um, the person who's doing everything they can to help or the person who's doing everything they can to keep you from getting any help. Right. You know, and, and I look at it that way just, you know, as a, as a matter of empathy, putting myself in a position of someone who's desperate for help. Yeah. It's a horrible I mean, place to be in when you know yeah. that you are literally relying on someone else's mercy, basically. Yeah. I mean, it, that's, that's an awful situation to have to be in. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. But I, um, I, I want to want to make a recommendation for you, since you're you're obviously interested in this and you sort of want this in depth examination of your own values and moral system. Um, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with Dr. Richard Carrier? Um, slightly. So through podcasts and okay. uh, stuff, I heard the name definitely. Okay, so he's written a book called Sense and Goodness Without God, and it's a very thick book and you'll read a chapter and you'll have to put the book down and think about it for a while. But that's, those are some of the best books. And I know Matt so, kind of resonated with Sam Harris's uh, morality book. Yeah. I haven't read that one, but um, yeah. he, he's recommended that before. Yeah. So that's another one if you want to check but, that um, out. You know, Richard Carrier's book, Sense and Goodness Without God, um, like I said, it's not a, a weekend read, but definitely worth your time if you can get mm -hmm. a hold of it. It should be in libraries or you can get it on Amazon. So. Uh, yeah, uh, probably uh, more that because um, I don't think that in German libraries they. Uh, yeah, well, I I look for it. Okay. All righty. Well, thanks very much for your call. Thanks for your answers. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks. Uh, bye bye. Have a good time. Okay, and we do have now. There's there's two that are topic relevant, but there's one that's been waiting since before the show. Yeah, let's so take a look. So we got We got to squeeze in Kenna. Yeah. Who's calling us from Sweden, by the way. Yeah, and thank you for your patience and for waiting. We just had these morality calls all, you know, pinged okay. up the same time yours so was and wanted to get through those. Is it Sweden that just changed their uh, work day to six-hour days? I don't know. I heard it wasn't as comprehensive as, I, as it was advertised yeah. or something, but I don't know. I don't know the specifics, but yeah. I think that's a phenomenal idea. <laughs> I would love that. Yes. I complain. Yeah. Yeah, I had a conversation with someone who said, um, yeah, but what about all the people who couldn't afford to take Hello. a pay cut? Oh, hey. Hey, Ke is that Kenneth? 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 Hello? Yes. Oh, okay, this good. This is Kenneth. Good, we can hear you. Hello. Oh, Hello. that was quick. I thought I was going to get uh, screened first. You sound like an expat living abroad. Well, <clears throat> thank you kindly, uh, but <laughs> I actually am. Are you kidding uh, me? You're you're I'm really I'm a natural Swedish. born. Student, wow, yes. great! You you've got the wow. American accent nailed. I know guys who've, who <laughs> I know guys from Sweden who've lived in the U.S. for a decade or more, who who still have a very thick accent. That's impressive. So, so, yeah. Well, uh, what can I say? I'm a natural. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so go for it. Uh, Let us have it. I'm also it. married to a uh, to an American, so uh, that, that probably helps. helps yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say a couple of things uh, about uh, previous uh, callers. First of all, the whole abortion question, I don't want to get bogged down in this because I have th something I want to get to. But 
it, to me, it's just amazing how there's always this assumption that the fetus must be protected from this evil mother. Like, people yeah. can't right, trust yeah. women to actually want to have children. That's just amazing and confusing to me. And yeah. the way you guys have laid this out, I know what you what you were talking about a moment ago. You laid out in a, an episode of Godless Bitches, and that mm -hmm. totally cleared the whole thing up for me. Awesome. So, uh, and uh, I didn't know that it was... Uh, coming out day today but happy coming out day oh yes thank you and i just want to say that there's room for all of us i think that in in, in uh if it ever seems like there's not room for all of us it's because people have gotten an idea in their head that some people you know don't belong or don't fit in yeah absolutely right. yeah so that's just what i want to say good so what i really want to talk about is uh is a kind of a heavy uh philosophical thing and um uh, i think that uh, to me, it's uh, it's best um, just condensed into the statement that I speak for only me, mm -hmm. um, and with the corollary that um, only I can speak for me. Right. And to me, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this thing: how our minds are so isolated from one another, and uh, how uh, we are the only way that we can know each other is. Uh, through getting to know one another and how we express ourselves and uh, not necessarily through language but you can get to know people as I'm sure you both know you've lived a long time with uh, with partners and you know how you get to know one another beyond words and stuff like that but still even though we we feel like we we understand somebody uh, there is there, there will always be this uh, until we invent telepathy <laughs> right obviously. yeah which we do, we're working on, uh, actually. It's interesting. They have computers now that can read brainwaves and translate them into images and sounds. Oh. So that's cool. One day we may be able to connect a mind to another mind. I know. Yeah, I, I was born in the early... That would be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that's I, a little uh, scary. The, the, when the last people packed up and flew back home from the moon, I was mm -hmm. five months old. I grew up oh, expecting wow. a fantastical future, and I feel like... The future still owes me. I was gonna <laughs> say you've been let down because I wanted my robot made by now, really. Yeah, yeah. All no, I got no. was the video phone, and I right. want the hover car not happening. It's like, yeah, oh. yeah it's not good. That's uh, <laughs> isn't that a, a Western problem though? Complaining about the things we don't have, not yeah, seeing. Yeah, first yeah. world problems, right? It's that meme. Yes. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're our minds so, are isolated. So, and, and, and about this, uh, this whole concept is that to me, thinking about this and thinking about how people reason and everything, to me it seems like uh, religiosity can come out of this thing very easily because mm -hmm. I, f I think uh, the realization of how isolated your mind actually is and these barriers between minds that will always be there, unless of course we invent telepathy. Right. But barring that, until we get the computers finalized. Yes, um, <laughs> I feel like when I think back to to being younger, being a kid, and growing up before having, I don't know, maybe I'm constructing memories and stuff. But just thinking back, <laughs> how you know when you're a child, you feel like you're you're you are known intimately, deeply known by yeah. your siblings, your parents, stuff like that. Some adults but, still believe that about other people. Well, I, yeah, and I think also that, that there is this, when you grow older and you become aware of the fact and you see uh, in many situations uh, how you fail to communicate with people <laughs> yes. and you fail to be understood. I'm thinking of a quote by Tom Lehrer here. Uh, talking about how in books and plays people bemoan for hours the fact they can't communicate with the people they love and he <laughs> he notes that if people can't communicate the very least they should do is to shut up okay yeah but uh, I digress the thing is that I think that when you when you reach a point like that it, it's a cause of loneliness and I think that one thing that can sort of push people in the direction of re religiosity is that you feel intimately deeply known Connected. on a very mm -hmm. visceral level uh but yeah I, I you know what just to interject because I, this reminds me of it i remember growing up and when i was little the question you asked um you know as far as trying to figure out what religion uh, other little children were being raised in was what do you believe 
mm -hmm. right? What do you believe? And that right. question was aimed at the entire structure of your church. Like, what church do you belong to and what do you believe? Because that dictated, right? And that's so weird to me that, that beliefs are, di the idea that beliefs are dictated instead of you coming to the belief, right? Which now is how I understand beliefs. But at the time I was little, I had been basically taught, this is our church, this is what we believe. Like, exactly. this is how it was presented. Yeah. So yeah, you do get this weird sort of feeling because they're basically teaching people that we all believe the same thing here. Mm -hmm. Right, and and it, <laughs> yeah. it gives the false impression. It's it's. I've heard so many times people calling into your show, saying how, you know, usually people call in with a challenge. Not so much now that you're uh, not on. Uh, yeah, I understand. On cable anymore, but yeah. people calling in and they're they're sort of challenging you like they are, you know, facing sure. the devil or something like that. And they're asked, "Well, what do you believe?" And when you turn around on them, they get kind of put on the spot and they will say things like well my church believes x y and z yeah, and right. my pastor says yeah and and i i think that there's obviously intellectual laziness in that but yeah. i think it's also uh the same way that i, f I feel that a mind has uh, a longing in it to be understood and to be known i think also the mind can recoil from things that it feels it doesn't understand and so that it can be comforting to, instead of thinking of these things yourself and formulating your position on them or just acknowledging that you don't know and that it's okay not to know, yeah. there's, there's uh, comfort, there's solace in the thought of just saying, well, my church believes yeah, X, right. Y, and Z about well, this. And, and that's one of the reasons I respect what the previous caller, Till, is trying to do. He's trying to to work out in his own mind, you know, how his moral system works. Right. And I have a lot more respect for someone like that who's willing to say, hey, you know, maybe right now I don't really have a good basis for my moral views or my moral system, but I'm working on it. Versus somebody who just read it in a book or had it handed to them, here's a list of things thou shalt not do. You know, right. and these are the rules. And in, in reality, no one learns their morality from a list of rules. You know, okay. you learn your morality exactly. by having your moral judgment challenged at certain levels. Right. And you have to work through those problems. And if you don't have your morality challenged, um, either because you've isolated yourself in a religious community where it, everybody falls back on the, well, we believe, um, you know, yeah. and there's this sort of corporate we, um, mm -hmm. Then you get stuck, and you're basically stuck in the. Um, I think it's uh, Lawrence Kohlberg that has the, the uh, stages of morality thing, and you get stuck in level four, which is the law and order phase. <laughs> you know, it's wrong because there's a rule. Yeah. It says it's wrong. And these are the people that don't know how to make rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they yeah. just know how to they follow just, them. They know there's a rule. Sure. And, right. and it's also where you see people, um, they can't own their own bigotry. So, you know, if they tell you, oh, being gay is wrong, it, they can't tell you why it's wrong. They just go and say, well, the Bible says. Well, that's the thing. It's not me. It's you know, the Bible. It's yeah. Like, yeah, but what do you it's think? A, it's like, like oh, I, exactly. I'm not sending you to hell. It, you know, God's not sending you to hell. Your actions are sending oh, you yeah. to hell, you know. That drives me up the wall. It's like, I, wanna, I would like to just interject here for a moment outside the dialogue. If I could get a thumbs up or down from the control room because we're running long, I'm okay running long. Yeah, I'm and cool with it. I don't want to queue up any more calls, but I'm okay staying to clear the calls that are in the queue right now. Um, and if the control room can just, yeah, they're good. So okay. we'll just go ahead and stay, and I will do my best to kind of clear these out. Um, I do agree with what you're saying, Kenneth. It reminds me of a quote somebody told me one time. They're like, do you realize that you use um, like conversation and intellectual connection as an intimacy, a form of intimacy? And I had never really thought of it like that. But I feel when I have, when I, I'm one of those people that I'll go somewhere and I'll meet somebody at some party or something that I don't know. And then at 2 a.m. I'm still, you know, crazy talking to them and they're talking to me and then we're like exchanging mm -hmm. numbers and like we're friends for life. Yeah. And yeah, oh yeah. I think when I have that connection, I just love it, right? It's like you've got this feeling, like you said, you get that feeling that this person understands me. We think right. a lot, we're simpatico. Right. And it makes you feel, well, for people like me anyway, which it's funny because when someone pointed that out, that's when I first thought, 
you mean other people don't do this? Because, <laughs> like, I thought everybody yeah. did this. Yeah. It's just rare because I rarely meet somebody who has a meeting of the minds with me like that. But, uh, and, you, and, yeah. and, you know, i, I got to be honest because I've, I'm a, a longtime uh, fan of uh, you guys on on here and on Godless Bitches. you got to get back together. Yes, yes, we've been and, talking. Uh, there is some chat. I don't want to set the yeah. internet on fire, but... Yes, we, we've been talking right. about this. But uh, but listening to uh, especially uh, the nonprofits because they're about my age and they're all gamers and everything. I, I listening to that. I get that exact feeling that you're talking about. Like, and it's so dangerous, isn't it? When you you know there <laughs> is somebody f famous or a public figure that you feel like you know. But oh then, yeah. yeah yeah. So so I feel a <laughs> like that with, with you guys because I re I recognize your way of thinking and and being. I, I encourage thing. everyone to Google parasocial relationships and see <laughs> yes. if that might be you. I'm gonna get yeah. <laughs> no, but there are different levels of it, and it's uh, somebody recommended that to me one time on the blog where I was talking about this issue, and they said that's a that's parasocial interaction when one person is in a relationship with another that doesn't know they're in a relationship. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yes, I get that too frequently. But I, I, uh, I, I'm sure it's not lost on you guys that how important that must be to a lot of people watching this uh, right now to have uh, this kind of outlet uh, yeah, yeah. To, to sort of hang out. I do want to. I, I do want to take this moment though to let people know, and, and I hope it doesn't, you know, break any hearts here. But let people know that we are not atheist TV hosts all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> like yeah. We have other aspects to our personalities and lives yes. that have nothing to do with the atheist experience that go on for most of our existence. This is yeah, a, we, this is a small part of what we're not of even what we getting paid today. Yeah. So I mean yeah. we, we, we like it and it's a worthwhile effort. Yeah. And, you know, clearly we're here so we support it. But I just I, you know I think some people what they'll do is they'll queue up hours and hours of TAE on YouTube and we become sort of like the host. Right. right. And it's like, no, we're people that do this as a volunteer effort. I'm here every month and a half maybe, you know, that's like the rest of my life I'm doing other things. So just right. FYI, don't get confused if you can yeah. help it. You've got you probably blew a lot of minds out there. <laughs> yeah. But th this one more thing I want to say that I, I've been thinking about, and uh, it's to do with uh, uh, the possibility of an afterlife, because uh, I, I will agree with you guys that the mind is what the brain does. It's mm -hmm. just uh, mm -hmm. an emergent property of the mind, and the mind, to my knowledge, can't exist without the brain. It needs a medium. Right. It's, it's like you can't right. take the process out of your computer right. and pretend like it's happening outside of your right. computer. That's how I see it. But um, when um, it's about it's about 12 or 13 years ago now, uh, a younger brother of mine died. He was uh, severely handicapped and so it was expected he actually lived longer than uh, people with his uh, condition do. But after that, my mother, who is a on and off religious person and uh, generally seems to me just very superstitious about things she she was talking about how she was going to go to this guy who was like a medium or something oh, yeah. and who somebody at her work knew through somebody else blah 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 um and i said uh first of all i was just floored that <laughs> uh that she would entertain that but it occurred to me that uh that's about the time, kind of, that I really learned how, how deep into who she is. The thing was that she, I don't know if she went to this guy, and of course, like all of these people, he, he since he had been given the gift, he graced other people with it <laughs> for compensation. I was going to say, for yeah. free? No. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, it's a gift that keeps on giving, I guess. Yeah. But the thing is that I, I told her, like, she shouldn't do that because, you know, wouldn't she entertain even the off chance that he can't do what he's saying what he's doing? Maybe he's honestly, you know, believing that he can do it and everything. Right. But, and yeah. I said, so I told her, uh, and, and she got defensive about it, so I didn't push the issue. But I felt like I had to expressly forbid her that, you know, uh, heaven forbid I should pass away before she does 
if she if she Don't goes to some me on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so oh, you know, expressly f forbade her to to go to somebody because she should understand that if she goes to somebody and they're not what they say they are, then somebody is just sitting there ad libbing, lying yeah. about yeah. what's going on yeah. inside my mind. Something that we can't know even while we're alive. And to me, of course, it's all a scam. Uh, yeah. Some people, I'm sure, <laughs> it's funny, understand though, it's that like they're... If, if you go to a psychic after I die, I'm not going to talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> right. don't even try it. Yeah. So even, if they tell you they reach me, you know I'm not lying. talking to yeah. them. So. And, and I want to recommend, actually, on, uh, on YouTube, uh, the uh, Richard Dawkins Foundation put up a, a, an hour-long, hour-and-a-half-long video of uh, Richard Dawkins hanging out with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And Tyson said the best thing when, when somebody said that they'd had an experience talking to an old dead relative, uh, what, did, what did you ask them? Like, did you ask anything important? Because yeah. all they ever Where'd said Where'd you hide the money, I'm, Grandpa? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think there was a caller a few years back who said when he was approached by somebody who said, well, I can hear him and he says everything's okay now, to, to ask him what, the thir what Kepler's third law was because the person would know what Kepler's third law was. But this this guy just said, oh, uh, that's not important now in the afterlife or yeah. some <laughs> bullshit like that. So oh. there's never any, any pertinent information. But, yeah. but it, yeah. it goes to, it, it really goes to this thing. And, and as you may have understood, I've thought a lot about this, about how the isolation, the isolated nature of the mind and how we're, we're limited in our way, in our ability not only to express what's going on inside our heads, but we we may also be limited in the way that we understand ourselves. And I don't know. To me, to me, it can seem so sweepingly, enormously tragic that all of us are walking around islands to one another, and we hear only faint echoes in the distance of what's really going on. So I'm really hoping that telepathy <laughs> does well, get. I mean, if you think about it, it may, it may not be quite that bleak, Kenneth. I mean, we are all human beings, and we all share an evolutionary history. So I think there's a lot that we do have in common. You know what I mean? It, it's not necessarily that we're so totally different. We can never ever connect. But I do agree with you that we probably think we connect more than we do. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually reminded. <laughs> uh, of a movie I saw long, a long time ago. Uh, it was, I think, the Coen Brothers' uh, uh, first movie or their breakout movie called Blood Simple, which is a story that ends very badly for many people that could have been prevented if just one of them had opened their mouth and said 10 uh, words at the beginning. There you go. Yeah. So. Tragic. Oh, and, tragic. Yes. We got other callers, Kenneth. I'm going to have to cut you off. I, I just want to say one last thing okay. about morality, where I get my morality from. Uh, right. YouTuber uh, Messianic Maniac, I'm not sure if you know him, but he said, yeah. w when he got the question, where do you get morality from, he said, upbringing, society, and conscience. And I think that's it. Those three things. I don't. I don't need to get any deeper into it than that. Yeah, and I think, I think the religious that people, should be though, good enough for anybody. The religious people would probably latch on to conscience, right? They would yeah. be like, "Well, where did you get your conscience?" Because then yeah. you, that's the arbiter, right, of right and wrong. Right. Behavior. That's Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder, yeah. and they're basically exactly. viewing it as the thing that tells you. And it's like, right. no, it's the innate experience that I have as a socially socially evolved animal. Exactly. So, <laughs> but uh, I'll. Uh, I'll uh, stop right there because okay. I know how frustrating right. it is for somebody right. to go on and on and not well, be picked. We, we need right. to, yeah, we need to hit these other callers and clear our queue. We've got a really nice crew in there working hard too, and they're staying for us. So yeah. we, and we have okay. people so. watching, and so we're hol we've, we're holding an entire building hostage right now. So wow. the <laughs> All right. power we have. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you very much. And All let's right. queue up. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this Kira in New South Wales, Australia. Yeah, and while we're getting Kira on the the line here. Oh. I want to say, it just so happens that we have a copy of Richard Carrier's Sense and Goodness Without God. So there you go. Emmett, or not Emmett, but um, uh, Ethan, no, not Ethan. <laughs> Gosh. Somebody. I recommended this book to a caller before, <laughs> and I cannot read my own handwriting. So anyway, so anyway, there it is, Sense and Goodness Without God by Richard Carrier. That's the book. And you can see, it's it's kind of a thick book yeah. there. So How many pages? Oh, let's see. 
We're waiting can, on Kira. He might as well. Yeah. So, um, content pages. Yeah, about 400 and something. Well, it's not so bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not huge. It's yeah. just, you know, stuff that you can't just read it and say, oh, I'll, yeah. one more chapter. You know, no, there you it's, go. It's not really a weekend read. It's a read a chapter, think about it, come back and read some more. What I like to do is go do the moral dilemmas and then see where you ranked, like percentage Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always, it's always like, yeah, that's an easy one. And then I pick and it's like, oh, yeah, you're like one of 5% of the people that would do that. And yeah. Like, no one else would do it. You're, there's something really wrong with you morally. <laughs> 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 I'm just like, why am I so weird? Uh, and the scary thing is it seems so clear to me, too. It's like, it's so clear. How could you do this? Yeah. How could people do that? But it's like, no, they all said they'd do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I'm wrong. I'm yeah. a terrible person. I'm an awful human no. being. I don't think so. Well, you know, and, and this whole morality thing, it, it kind of reminds me of a conversation uh, that I had um, on another thing with uh, Dale McGowan. And he was talking about teaching children morality okay. and, without God. Sure. And, and some people had asked him, oh, hey, aren't you concerned that your kid's going to become a theist or something like that if you don't? have these specifically anti-religious messages, and it looks like We Kira, lost Kira. We lost Kira. Kira probably got tired of waiting. She, got, she had suffered from give up. So it looks like the next topically related one that was also the next one in the queue would be Cameron in Red Deer, Canada. Yeah. Is that Alberta? Is that what the AB is? I, I think so. Okay. We'll take a guess. Or No, that's probably not Alberta. Gosh darn it. I don't know. I messed it up. I have no idea. My apologies, Canada. Anyway, so he was saying that, you know, if you teach them how to, to develop their own moral system based on their values and you, you teach them sure. your, your values kind of thing, it doesn't matter if they're a theist because their yeah. morality is going to be solid. Um, so, you know, their, their particular religious views will be less important than the fact that they have a good, strong moral system. Hi, Cameron. Are you on the line? I am. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. you sound great. A little muffled, but you're, you're clear. Okay, fantastic. I'm outside, so that may be the muffling. Okay, uh, okay. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Jeff. Glad to chat with you guys. Yeah, you too. Um, happy Thanksgiving. I know it's not there yet for you, but that's today for us here. Oh, ah, that's true, true. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll be quick. I know you guys got other callers. Uh, my biggest thing was I just kind of want to chat for a moment. Um, I know that uh, difficulty you guys have experienced as well as myself as an atheist is the idea of people coming across and saying, you know, you don't believe because of something bad that's happened to the church or, or an experience right. with a pastor or something like yeah. that. Um, I, I also am gay, and I just want to kind of get your uh, your guys' kind of sense on the issue of how, you know, very often that's presented as the reason. People are often like, oh, you're gay. You, I've had people try to explain to me why it's okay with God in their view and this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. one is sort of the a derivative of you just want to sin kind of thing and and to me you know it's really dis disrespectful very dismissive of um, yeah. basically the process you had to go through to get rid of all of the religious indoctrination oh um, definitely and and then I think it, 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 it's disrespectful and also the aspect that it does overlook the challenges that I faced uh, because right. I until I was 18 I was very strongly Christian and uh, you know kind trying to make that lateral with being gay is very difficult very very big struggle yeah well, and, and the thing is, I, I mean, I came out as gay you know, long before I, well, I, I knew I was gay a long time before I realized I was an atheist. And the two had absolutely nothing to do with each other. So, I mean, if I had wanted to be a gay theist, there are plenty of churches who um, they've decided to disregard that part of the Bible, you know, and 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 basically embrace gay people as members of the church. So finding a church to attend, if I'd wanted to cling to my belief in a God, that wouldn't have been difficult. Oh, um, of course. And I mean, that's the thing. It is possible. And, and I think people just kind of tend to overlook that. And they, right. they just make the same application. They You're breaking up a little bit, Cameron. Yeah. There's a little bit of breakup oh, in your call. Because you're gay, that, that's why you're gay. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, here you and, go. and it's never the case. 
Oh, sorry, I apologize. No, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, you you broke up, up a little bit when yeah, you were talking, I, I but, but I, I think we got, up. like, yeah, the gist of it. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, and that's pretty much what I want to kind of get across. It's something that I've struggled with a lot, and that's one particular issue where people are always jumping to the same conclusion. Well, before I let you go, though, I just want to point out, I mean, don't you think a lot of that just has to do with they, they have difficulty actually accepting that someone might have thought this through and drawn another conclusion? Like, for them, it's easier to just say you're gay than it is to sit there and think, maybe there is another way to look at this that I haven't considered or that I'm not thinking of. That's oh, a scary absolutely. thought for, the, for somebody yeah, that I, devotes I, their life to a cause. I, yeah. Oh, of course. And I, I, totally, I totally agree with that. I think that's a lot of what it is, is people are, are unaware of how much thought someone who is an atheist tends to have put into this. And yeah. it's, for me, it, it's more than I did when I was a theist, ever. Yeah, and yeah. This, this is the preacher rhetoric, right? I mean, this is what they teach from the pulpit to, to disseminate. This is the meme that goes out to the masses to say they just want to sin. And that way you hear this, you hear somebody ha that has a, uh, like you said, you, they may try to make an argument or say I'm an atheist and they mention they're gay and suddenly that script plays, right? It, the switch flips and oh, they just want to sin. And suddenly yeah, they don't have definitely. to think about this anymore. They don't have to hear you. Like Jen said, they can just dismiss you entirely because you just want to sin. And the, and the preacher has already got that in their heads where that's just the thing, the wall that comes down. And then I don't have, that's what indoctrination is, right? It's putting these walls course, in yeah. place so that they all come down and then I don't have to think anymore. So that wall comes down and then I don't have to think. Yeah, and that's really what it comes to. It seems oftentimes when I discuss these things with theists, they are looking for the first shutout they can find. Right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. They're looking for the reason why you would reject it, because it couldn't be that you really, really thought this through. Yeah, it could be that they're wrong. That's the one thing. <laughs> exactly. That's yes. the conclusion, right? Like, if you thought it through and you came to this conclusion, maybe I'm not right. And that's, yeah. a, that's an untenable uh, thought for them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. and it is, and, and it comes down to again. You run into a lot of the other conversations. I know you guys have already had a caller on today discussing, you know, morality and, and where atheists tend to get those from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've always, I, I've been watching your show for years. I think Matt Dillahunty's done a fantastic job discussing morality and specifically secular morality. Uh, really, really fantastic stuff. So, yeah, uh, I appreciate what you guys do with the show. I think it's a lot of help. Right. I've been watching you know, for Thanks. like six or seven years. So. Cool. Thanks. Thank That's you, Cameron. Fun. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And Tracy, I also really enjoyed that talk you did a few years back on uh, family values. Oh, really thanks. Actually, that was well this done. year. <laughs> so, was that this year? It is this year, yeah. So that was cool. I'm glad you liked it. Oh, yeah, it was really good. I found it on YouTube. I thought it might have been a little older. No, uh, I probably oh. just look super young and beautiful in that video. Yeah. It's like just threw you, you know, right? You always do. You always do. So. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, sh I probably shouldn't even go there. Like, All right. Well, anyway, thank you, Cameron. Thank you guys very much for the show. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thanks, you too. And the, then, did you have something you wanted to add? No. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> this is Raphael. In Baden. There's another one from Germany. Baden-Württemberg, Germany. I know what that you is. you do it. Okay. Uh, better you than me. Yeah. So let's so, get uh, Raphael on the line. You know, Cameron's call um, reminded me of um, a call we had back in the old studio from a guy who had a traumatic brain injury. Yeah, that sounds good. And he, he was an atheist, and he had so many people yes. who said, oh, you're just an atheist because you're mad at God yeah. because you had this injury. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought that was really disrespectful of, totally. of him. Yeah, it would, I mean, could you imagine yeah. if I said to somebody, you're only religious because you had a brain injury? Yeah. Like, uh, the insult of that, yeah. you know what I mean? It's just it's horrible yeah. to imply that because, you know, this or that happened in your life, that's why you, that's why you believe in God, because... Yeah, because you know, you there's something damaged something in your lean brain. On. You're messed yeah. up. Yeah, no, that's not, I would never yeah. say that to somebody. And this is uh, Raphael. You're on the line. Uh, hello. 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 Uh, yeah, I also had a couple of uh, comments for. Go the for it. You're our callers. final caller. No, no, no. no. Uh, since since Kenneth called, uh, my whole brain is like <laughs> gone through a blender. His rant was just too epic for me. Yeah. Uh, also, he did put pressure on me for the American accent, so uh, thanks, oh. Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, um, I had really many things to talk about, but um, I'll just focus on one thing uh, because of the time. Um, I've seen in a debate um, between some Muslim and um, Lawrence Krauss, where Lo uh, I, yeah, Lawrence Krauss was like, Okay, but what about Sharia law and what about marrying little children and um, 
the Muslim then countered with, um, what do you think about incest? And Lawrence Krauss was like, well, if they use contraception and uh, if they're two consenting adults, then maybe, I don't know, that might be acceptable. Well, and the Muslim was like, gotcha. You why? Are yeah, incest. why? You are so, yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, what about incest? Like, why, why is it so looked down upon if, um, I mean, first of all, um, LGBTs were, or are looked down upon and um, I think it's weird because the argument goes like this there are two consenting adults and um, when they love each other they should have rights and all that stuff and I'm totally supporting that but somehow when it comes to siblings that is not really uh, what people tend to think um, yeah, and I'd like to just interject here that when I talk about this issue, I definitely um, draw a, a hard line with things like um, uncles and nieces and fathers and daughters and mothers and sons and stuff like that. Right. Because when you're in a position of helping to rear a child, you, you, you have an authority, authority over that person that um, can be abused and misused. And I think Jen has pointed out before that like, you could use that to groom that child. So yes. you, you have definite like, um, ethical questions and issues that surround a, a, a relative who would have some significant authority over the, the development of another relative, right? And that I would call out as like, this would concern me. Um, but when you're talking about siblings, yeah, I don't, I don't really, uh, I, I guess I, I don't have too much of an issue with it. I saw um, a documentary yeah. one time where they were showing uh, couples that had met as adults that were siblings and then they fell in love, right? And first of all, this rarely occurs. <laughs> this is yeah. not a common yeah, yeah, sure. thing. So it's sure. not, if it, there, anybody that thinks that if we didn't have these laws, I'm going to run to marry my brother, I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, most of us are not going there. But on occasion, people who were not raised together generally, and I, I'm not saying that it can't happen if you were raised together, but often it's when they weren't reared together, they meet and they end up liking each other more than they expected. They're not trying to do anything horrible. This particular documentary followed a couple of different couples, but one of the couples in particular that really made me realize um, that the rules in place were more of a problem than the problem was that the uh, the couple actually had a son, and the son was healthy, right? And and it is true that you can, you do increase your odds of like um, genetic issues with children when you get super close uh, relatives uh, reproducing. But not everybody that marries reproduces, and not everybody that is like chromosomally compatible uh, is. It's like we don't we don't really put rules on people reproducing even if they have like for example both people can contribute a particular gene that might be a problem for the child and maybe it's not that they're married they may just both carry this gene I mean maybe it's not that they're siblings but they both carry this gene right and we know that the odds of producing a viable offspring in that situation might only be 25 percent but we don't have a rule that says they can't they can't have kids, right? So the idea when people say like, well, but there's these reproduction issues, it's like, hey, we don't have rules about that. Yeah. We allow people to try to reproduce even when we know that they're carrying particular issues in, in their genes that, that are probably going to result in three-fourths of their attempts which, not ending well. Which um, for like a random sibling couple, you know, just there's no history in the family of these consanguineous relationships. So say a brother and a sister who maybe didn't even know they were siblings, meet, fall in love, get married, have children, their risks of having um, a child with any kind of genetic problem are pretty small. I've read it's, different it's, results. Yeah, it's, I used to it's say usually, that and then I've read different things and so now yeah, I kind of backed off that a little every, bit. Yeah, everything I've, I've seen is just, it, it's been way overstated as a kind of a justification for keeping people well, I from... Well, I don't think it's a justification for keeping people from getting married. Yeah. I, but I have read different studies since my initial thoughts about it not being that, that uh, yeah. highly problematic. And I think it's more problematic than I maybe... Ex 
thought initially, yeah. especially because the documentary that talked about it did mention that, and they were saying that it wasn't that big of a deal. But it, I've read since then things that make me question whether whether the rates aren't higher than what I initially thought. Yeah, and it's possible. And and, and also, it, it ultimately depends on whether there's some kind of, of you know, problematic gene in the gene pool yeah. anyway. But this, yeah, but the and point is, this like, doesn't matter. Yeah, it we doesn't. Don't, because we don't screen yeah. people for these things, and there are people who know they ca they're carrying particular issues that if you get both parents contributing, it's going to be death to that child, mm -hmm. and yet we allow those people to marry and reproduce, and we do not have rules against that. So when someone says there's a genetic concern, it's irrelevant. We do not police that in our society. Yeah. So this is not an issue for reproduction. It is not an issue, um, like you say, they're both adults, they're both consenting. Um, in the particular program that I saw, they were living as a family, and they were just like a normal family. It was mom, dad, and little boy. And when the, uh, somebody found out about this and reported it, and because there were laws against it, they actually sent the father to prison, right? Not jail, prison. So he goes to prison because of this. And then they tell him, if you go, when we release you, if you go back to your family, we're going to send you back to prison. To me, this yeah. was abominable, right? I mean, this guy loved his wife, who happened to also be his sister, and they had a child together, and they were a family, and they loved each other, and they were bonded, and there was nothing sick and twisted and horrible about these people. And the idea that he should have to go to prison, or anyone should have to go to prison, or that this should mm -hmm. involve anybody but these people, was appalling to me. And it really changed the way I thought about it, which I, I don't even know that I thought about it that much before, because to me, the idea of sibling incest was sort of relegated to ancient Egypt and you know, yeah. royalty, like issues where this actually was considered more normal in other cultures where particular rulers were encouraged to, to marry with their siblings. So I knew that there was historically, um, you know, situations in which cultures accepted this kind of sibling incest and it wasn't considered like weird. It was not common in the populace. But yeah. there were situations where everybody understood this is a brother and sister, they're getting married, they're going to reproduce, and this is what we expect. Um, so I, I knew that it, you know, it, there were certain acceptable situations for it. And then when I saw this documentary, I was just like, you know, there's so few people that are going to do this. Is it really so bad that we have to be sending people to prison? Um, it's like not, I didn't, I, I don't get that. And I, I don't, I think that it's, um, it's cruel. It was cruel to break that family up. Yeah. Well, and, and I would say I find it really ironic that a Muslim is saying gotcha to um, Lawrence Krauss over an incest question because while it, you know brother sister kind of sibling marriages are pretty rare uh, first cousin marriages worldwide are not and that's where you get into a real problem with passing on um, genetic problems uh, that's the kind of consanguineous relationships that people should worry about yeah. and let me give you some interesting statistics here okay oh, um, let's see 55 percent of marriages between Pakistani Muslims um, Pakistan Muslim immigrants in the United Kingdom are between first cousins. 55% consanguineous marriages. Um, within the Arab community, it's very common. Um, this is preferred. It's estimated between 40 and 50% of all marriages are consanguineous or between close family members. Um, and that varies be between nations. Um, let's see, about 67% of Saudi marriages are between close relatives as are 54% of all marriages in Kuwait, 39% um, of marriages in Egypt, and about 15% of all Lebanese marriages were between close relatives. So it's very interesting that a Muslim would uh, say gotcha. Uh, and it is also very easy to be cynical about this when, uh, for example, Christians believe you come from Adam and Eve, yeah. and <laughs> there the incest line goes down until the flood comes and then it just starts, starts all again. over again yeah. and then he probably i don't know how many times he genocided almost the whole earth i, right. I, I don't really know yeah. well, it's, well and, and look at lot's Lot daughter, daughter. And, yeah, that's <laughs> and that's the thing because when i, I remember when i used to study uh you know at the church and they had lot and his daughters they would say well but you know god didn't tell them to do that and god didn't say he condoned that and it's like you know what both of those girls gave birth to babies who became nations and 
in my understanding of the Old Testament, when your when your child became a nation, that was God kind of giving His blessing to this thing, right? I mean, yeah. You, a lot of times right. God God punished the children when parents mm-hmm. had done something wrong and killed them. But in this case, instead of you know killing the babies, which is what God normally you did some evil sex thing, was that um, He made nations of them. This is yes. a positive, right? So Lot and his daughters uh, had a bit of a party, and then. They produce some good stuff, according to the story that I remember. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, um, I agree with uh, everything you say so far. You said a lot, <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, can't really comment on that. Um, but there was one thing I wanted to add. Um, yeah, about the prison thing. Yeah. That yeah. you got sent to prison. Um, that there are so few people uh, for which that applies that there's no real pressure right, right, for yeah. the government to introduce any right. laws but also right. on the other hand um, there are no real laws to to push positive rights to incest families you're right That's you're true. right and it probably there, is there, because there it's are not, such a there small are not so many like LGBT that they are really getting the word out there and trying to change something yeah um, so yeah. there's no pressure there on both on both sides. I definitely did not. I mean, when I thought about the idea of this particular family living next door to me, I was like, you know, in a heartbeat, I would have no problem with it. Yeah. And this guy in prison is not helping anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I felt myself um kind of cringing when I when I uh, heard the argument, the debate, and I thought I I really never thought about incest mm-hmm. before. Right. But mm-hmm. it was always like a bad thing. And I <laughs> right. Never. Yeah. I never gave it much thought and. When I thought about it, it was like, well, what a... Well, the, and, and part of that is, this is one of the reasons it's so rare, because most of us, having been raised with our siblings in the same household, whenever this thought of, you know, <laughs> having <laughs> that kind of relationship with a sibling comes up, we're all like, ew. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I mean, most, it's like, no. most of us did not... The reason, the reason that you never thought about it is because... I mean, do you have siblings? Yeah, I have to. Okay, so do I, right? And the idea, now, don't get me wrong, it's like on a scale of people, there's definitely people I would rather not have sex with than my brother. Exactly, (laughs) yes. Right? Like, I I would do my brother over a lot of people, but I've never wanted, like, uh, there's never been a thought in my mind to, like, go do my brother. And I definitely never, you know, it's like you don't want to marry the guy who plays indoor football with you and, you know, yeah, uses that yeah, as an excuse yeah. to pummel you. I mean, this is, you know, it's like, yeah, he did nice things when I was a kid as an older brother, but also could be a bit of a jerk. And I'm sure that he thought I was a bit of a jerk as a younger sister sometimes. So it, it works. But you, you don't you don't grow up saying, oh, I just love this person. I want to marry them. You grow up saying, rawr, 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 rawr. You know, yeah. I, I love you despite the rawr, rawr, yeah. Rawr, rawr. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, that was basically all I... <laughs> okay. I mean, I will, I will call next show. Okay. Talk all right. Stuff. Just call every time. No, don't. Yeah, I, I will don't. just call every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Right? All right. a wrap here. That's the end of it, and we're all going to be heading the Thread Gills one more time on North Lamar. Right. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks crew. Thanks, callers. Yes. Thanks, audience. <laughs>